What is poppin' party, people? It is the July Q&A episode of the Wind Up Podcast. Thank you so much, as always, for being with me today, tomorrow, whatever day you're listening to this. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I, this is always, I think this is probably, every month this ends up being my favorite episode because we get to dive into so many different topics, so many different questions, and try and just go down the rabbit hole. It also helps immensely with the podcast in general because it gives me other topics and things to explore in future shows. So a friendly reminder for everyone out there that if you have a question that you want answered about wine, winemaking, vineyard management, the hospitality industry, and just Napa in general, you can submit them in the comments and our DMs on any of our social networks. You can head to our website, mtgawines.com, scroll to the bottom, there's a little form to fill out and send your questions in to us. That way, for those of you that know how to get a hold of me uh, via text, or email that works also uh, be sure to keep liking subscribing uh, the more kind of interaction we get with the podcast and the more it's shared uh, the better it does and all the algorithms and all that good stuff so if you like what you're hearing please make sure you hit like on YouTube uh, please make sure you're subscribing on YouTube as well as uh, through whatever a feed whether it's Spotify whether it's Apple and uh, Apple podcasts that'll be the best ways to kind of support the show and what we're doing Without any further ado, let's get into these questions, shall we? We're going to be covering a bunch of topics today. I, I got a, I quickly peruse through them, and we're basically kind of painting the corners on a lot of different things we've talked about over the last month, month and a half, uh, between the growing season out here and how things are looking this particular year. We're talking more about barrels, and we're going to be talking about a little bit about that kind of hospitality and visiting Napa and kind of what to expect in terms of traffic and getting here and all this other kind of stuff. So we'll start off, though, with the growing season. Very simply put, how is this growing season going to turn out? That is the question, man. If I had a crystal ball and could shake it and get an answer, I would love to have it. Uh, the answer is we don't know. You know, there's this is the time of year and throughout the growing season, it's it's kind of this you're very this skeptical like optimism is the best way that I can probably describe it because all of us are just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop if it's a particularly good year like I think it is this year you know it's been very cool uh, we've gotten plenty of rain it's finally warmed up and it's staying within this nice lovely uh, temperature range it's still cooling off at night we're not having these really huge long extended heat spikes it's going to turn out to be a pretty solid year if, and that's a big ass if, it continues. Because we don't know what's going to happen in August. We don't know what's going to happen in September or October. You know, if we happen to have another giant heat spike in September, if we happen to get early rain in October, I mean, there's all kinds of curveballs that can still come our way. So we're very optimistic at this stage, which is basically all you can do with farming. I mean, Mother Nature is in the driver's seat. You're in the back seat with no seatbelt and some old vehicle. Just she's and she's taking the turns hard and fast, and you're just along for that ride, ricocheting off the doors back and forth. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That it's it's literally that, and you're just hoping to hold on tight and get to the destination in one piece. That's basically farming, in my opinion. Like, it's just kind of a mess at all times. You're always optimistic and hoping for the best to happen, but you know there's going to be some sort of curveball that comes your way, and you're going to need to adapt, overcome, and try and mitigate it to the best of your ability. So long story longer, the growing season so far has been, in my opinion, excellent. We are a little bit behind where we are normally, but I think that's a good thing for the Valley and for the wines very selfishly that we like to make but i think for many many people and as long as the weather holds up into the rest of the fall we're going to be looking beautiful absolutely beautifully because the reason the reason why i love these long seasons is that if it stays very even keeled and mellow you get longer hang time out in the vineyard you can build more complexity and more flavor and all kinds of things in the grapes to make take your wine from being good to great Extending the season in that way can really, really help the overall quality of a vintage. The downside is that once you start getting late into the season, you know, you start risking, you know, rain, you start, you could get a late heat spike in September or early October like we did last year. 
you know, there's a lot of things that can happen as you push things back. You know, there's just a bigger window for things to kind of come your way. So again, you're kind of hoping for the best, but all things kind of being equal, you know, if it's, if it's, if it continues, we're looking for, I mean, I'd say arguably one of the better vintages that Napa has had recently. You know, I, I immediately go back to probably 2019, maybe uh, 2016 as a couple of vintages in recent history that this kind of reminds me of. Uh, not quite as this dramatic in terms of, I think, the delay and kind of the time we're behind right now, but just where things are at and the quality potential of this vintage um, is very much in line with that. So we're knocking on wood. We're doing our anti-rain dances. We're doing a little bit of everything to try and make sure that we get through the rest of this growing season because in about a month and a half, grapes are coming in. It's, you know, when we get to August 1st, that first week of August or second week of August is typically when we see some sparkling wine producers start to get going. And we know that once the sparkling wine producers get going, we are four weeks out. We are a solid month, maybe three weeks if it gets really warm. So we know in the next couple of weeks, we're getting that first shot across the bow and we're going to have to start to get ready for the actual craziness that is the harvest season. So I think this season has all the potential in the world, but we're going to have to wait and see how it all plays out. And this is the same story every single year. We all kind of talk a big game about how good it's been so far, or even how bad it's been so far, but there's always this chance that something else goes one way or the other. You hang a hard left somewhere and you hit that door pretty hard, and now you're, you are now you got a bruise to answer for, because Mother Nature's just driving that car. Pedal to the metal, man, I'm telling you. In conjunction with this, next question. It was so rainy in California this year. How is that affecting the growing season? We touched on that a little bit. When you have these really cool, wet growing seasons, it extends the season because you don't have your vines butt out nearly as fast. So if you compare this to, say, 2022 last year, you know, February was one of the warmest, driest Februarys we had had, you know, where, at, where we were like seeing 70 and sunny. You know, we probably saw two or three days worth of sun in February this year and March as well. It was just raining nonstop, you know, felt like we were living in the Pacific Northwest for a while. And, you know, when you have that warm start to the year, it expedites things. The vines start pushing out a little bit sooner. The growing season starts sooner. And if it warms up quickly, you're going to have an earlier season. When you have these cooler vintages, the exact opposite is true. It kind of stunts everything for a little bit longer. The vines don't push out quite as much as early, and you're set back. I mean, the thing was, without this last little bit of heat that we've received, we are probably closer to like three weeks behind. We're probably right around two weeks now. So we've played maybe a tiny, a half a week, maybe a week's worth of catch up as things have really started to warm up into the season, which is exactly what we want. We need it to warm up at some point so that the grapes can actually get to the desired level of ripeness that we want to make great wine. So as far as the rainy season, I can tell you this much, the reservoirs are still full. Like there, there's so much water in the ground that I, from what I can tell, very few people have had to irrigate nearly as much as they have had to in past years. There's pl plenty of water to go around, which helps relieve a little bit of stress too with the growing season. So that if you do have these heat spikes rolling through, hopefully, you're not gonna run out of water before the end of the season, right? Like that's kind of this game of chicken. That's kind of what happened last year with that giant heat spike that we had, is that people were just, it was so hot and it was dry, people ran out of water. And there's no way to even try to mitigate some of that heat that rolled through. And realistically, when it's 115 for like five days straight, there's not a lot you can do anyway. But have, being out of water is, that's a tough boat to be in at that time of the season when you see that kind of heat rolling through. So, you know, if there's plenty of water to go around that makes our farming a little bit easier, it doesn't mean it's any less stressful, but at least we have that tool still in our tool belt that we can use. We can pull it out when we need to use it and make sure that the vines stay healthy when we do have these, you know, warmer stretches where it jumps up into the 100 degree range. So all in all, the rainy season is pushed back the season a little bit it's going to be a little bit more delayed than what it is normally for us for example typically we have our white wines and uh, Brittany has her Blair Payton uh, wines uh, for her rosé coming in usually the third week of August maybe into the fourth week of August 
we're looking like after Labor Day right now for those. So you're looking at that week or two, you know, past what kind of the normal harvest date is going to be. So that means we'll probably be harvesting Cabernet in mid to late October. Uh, it's really going to extend the season back. Uh, so it's going to be a long, drawn out, hopefully very even keeled season uh, when it's all said and done. We'll probably kind of have this dash of white wines that come in first, a little bit of break, Merlot comes in, a little bit of break, Cabernet, Cap Franc come in. It's going to hope, you know, in a perfect world, it'll kind of tear itself out where every week, week and a half, we have kind of new stuff hitting the deck. Then after a couple of weeks, we're barreling down and getting stuff into the cellar and we're kind of done with that batch. So it, that's like the ideal even keeled, hey, we just get to work through harvest and we don't have to worry too much about trying to do everything all at once. That has happened. It's happened a lot. And that's just the nature of the gig. Every once in a while, you run into stuff like that and you just, you roll with the punches as best you can. All right, a couple of seller related questions for barrels in particular. So if French oak barrels are considered the best, why not just use them entirely? I mean, that's typically, I mean, that's why I use only French oak barrels. Uh, I, I am toying with the idea of using some acacia wood this year and maybe some American oak, but that's a stylistic consideration. Uh, this goes back to kind of the barrel aging conversation that we had in a show earlier this month. And when it comes to, there's a lot of folks that kind of assume that French oak is the best because it's the most expensive. And this is the thing with wine, it's the thing with barrels, it's the thing with anything, is that just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's the best. It's just going to be different than something else, right? Now, when it comes to an art form like winemaking, in my opinion, there's no such thing as the best. Certain barrels are going to impart certain characteristics, certain flavors, and stylistically, if your wine is leaning that direction and it needs a certain barrel then American oak might be better, or French oak might be better, Hungarian or Slovenian oak might be better. It just depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. So I wouldn't say that any barrel is necessarily better than another barrel. You know, for what I use in the cellar and for any winemaker, you know, we have kind of our choice favorites, the ones that, hey, I love Merlot in this barrel, or I love Cabernet in that barrel. And we lean our wines and push them in that direction. But just because I think Gamba is the best barrel for our Merlot doesn't mean someone else is going to use it for their Merlot. They might do a barrel trial and give it a shot and be like, all right, let's see if it works. And if it doesn't, then they'll move on to something else. Or they've got their Merlot program dialed in and they're not going to worry about it. They don't need to iterate. They're already known for this certain style. And they go from there. And that's kind of the big thing with when it comes to barrels is that you, it helps build that house style. So once you have that dialed in, you're really not going to see these huge differences year in and year out. Now, some cooperages might come in and fade away as time goes on, but it's not going to be like a hard shift. The wine will still be consistent, at least if you're good at what you do, the wine will still be consistent. And it's not going to be like going to the store to buy a Pepsi and whatever you buy ends up tasting like Mountain Dew, right? It's going to be still within a good you know, margin of error so that hopefully you as a consumer don't notice this huge change within the program. I mean, this is something that we try to talk about in any of our tasting note videos or in our newsletters, or if there's kind of these bigger announcements of things that we're changing, like especially when we were evolving our Cabernet program, we really wanted to try and be transparent with like, hey, here's what we're doing. We're not gonna make this wine anymore. We're switching gears and going this whole different direction with our Cabernet program. And we tried to be very, very open and honest about that because we knew that certain folks really liked that first style of Cabernet that we were making. And we didn't want them to buy the new one and expect the same thing because they're just not the same. So, you know, I think that's something that, I don't know. I don't know if there's a lot of wineries that tend to be that transparent because, you know, we tend to worry about losing customers because we change a little something or we do something a little bit different or maybe a vineyard site changes. And that's a tough pill to swallow. You know, it's tough as it is being a small wine business. We don't want to stack the deck against us. But I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that an informed consumer is a better consumer. And I'd rather be honest and upfront about what we're doing rather than not. When it, whether it comes to our barrels or any, you know, we've talked a lot about additives and extracts and whether or not we do or do not use them in our case and all kinds of other things. It's just very, very subjective. And I think that that subjectivity 
you know, for me, I want to try and explain and kind of rationalize it for everybody so that hopefully when you taste our wines, it makes sense, right? That you can actually smell and taste the wine and be like, okay, I understand what he's getting at. Because you don't have to be a master sommelier to decide, hey, I like this wine because it's in this French oak versus, oh, I don't like this wine because it's in American oak. I know plenty of people that are huge fans of silver oak. I know plenty of people that aren't. And a lot of that stems from their barrel program because it's this really intense 100% new oak. It hits you upside the head. It's a big, bad wine. I, and bad, I mean like bad as in it's cool or it's good, not like bad as it's in technically bad. It's just, you know, it's it's badass, I guess I probably should have said. Whatever, please, don't judge me. I'm doing this on the fly. But you know what I mean? It, that Sometimes that heavy oak impact can be a little too edgy for some people, and sometimes people want a little bit more finesse. And I think personally that French oak barrels provide a little bit more finesse, which is why I tend to favor them outside of other alternatives to French oak. That just tends to be my own subjective style. I would never say that oak, French oak barrels are the best. They just work for what we do and they work for a lot of people. Uh, so it's, they're pretty tried and true. But again, if you're getting into the wine industry or you're making your own wines, you're going to have to decide for yourself what direction you want to go because sometimes that French oak barrel just might not do the trick. You might have to change it up and do something else to get where you want to go. Uh, related question as well. Uh, why not use 100% new barrels if they have the biggest and best impact on the wine? So this is, this is a major point of contention, I, I think, because I know a handful of people that are like, oh, we can make better wine. All we need is more new barrels. And it, it, every time I hear someone say that, and it happens more often than you would think, because it, it's never been something that, it's not been a subject that I've really broached before with folks about their barrel program, but I've heard it more often now than I have recently that, oh, we'll just buy more new barrels and it'll make the wine that much better. And I, number one, I don't buy that because uh, a new barrel, I, like we talked about this a little bit in the barrel episode. So if, if you happen to miss the barrel episode, like these last two questions, it's worth going back and listening to that other episode and downloading it because I try and dial in a little bit of like the rationale as to why we use certain barrels, whether they're new or used and work our way down the line. But 100% new barrels aren't always the best option. I hate to say it. Number one, they're crazy expensive. Uh, they are typically the second biggest cost center when it comes to a wine business. And realistically, if you're using 100% new oak, I mean, the wine better absorb it well because as soon as it gets too woody and too like two by four-y, I mean, it's like over salting a dish. You can't necessarily get that salt out of there. Like it's just gonna be this big intense oak flavor that overpowers a lot of the other things that are going on in that wine. So I think that was one of my biggest pet peeves actually about moving back to Napa and tasting a lot of Cabernets and getting to know some of the newer producers is that it just kind of felt like people were just throwing new oak around as if, oh, if we just use 100% new oak, this will make sure that we get these highly rated wines and, you know, that everyone will buy them. This is just the, this is kind of the formula for making great wines. You need 100% new oak. And I just don't think that's the case. You know, I think it takes, I mean, there are wines that we make that are 100%, you know, new oak. There are a lot of wines that aren't. They use some combination of used barrels and new barrels. And I think a lot of people typically lean that way. But there are a handful of folks that I know, they're like, 100% new oak is the only thing we do because that's the best thing for the wine. And I'm like, I don't think so, respectfully. That wine is over oaked and frankly, you should tone that down a notch. But... I'm not going to tell them to throw the baby out the bathwater. If they're consumer, if they're selling that wine, their consumers love that oakiness. And hey, more power to you. Have at it. Again, it kind of comes down to the dollars and cents of the conversation and whether or not you're actually selling that wine. And if people love it, more power to you. I am that person, though, that I love a lot of different layers and a lot of complexity in the wine. And by that, I mean not being one dimensional. It's not just this oak bomb with some fruit hanging around. It's a combination of the oak flavor, the different flavors that that, you know, really adds to the wine, whether it's vanilla or chocolate or coffee or toffee or whatever the case is. Uh, it's some of the fruit flavors, whether it's your red fruits, your brew, bleh, blue fruits or your black fruits, whatever the case may be. Uh, you have the acidity and the tannins, whether it's the tannins coming directly from the grapes or it's the tannins that are coming from the barrels. Uh, there's there's just all there's all kinds of things that you really need to take into consideration when you're trying to craft a wine 
and just throwing 100% new oak at it because that's what the quote unquote best thing to do is, I think is just kind of a fallacy because the reality is, is that your wine might not stand up to that. You know, we've had years where our Cabernet, you know, typically we lean closer to like 80%, at least 50%, if not like 80% new oak. And there've been years where we've done 100% but it's kind of few and far between because for us, it really comes down to what the wine needs. In fact, I have two new barrels that are sitting in the cellar. They've been sitting in there for almost a year because we didn't use them. I was like, oh, our wines do not need these two barrels this year. They taste just fine without them. We're not going to just throw these new barrels in there. We're trying to keep them in good condition. We're trying to keep them hydrated. That way, if I can use them this year, I absolutely will. But just because I have these new barrels that I purchased doesn't mean I'm just going to throw them at something to, for the sake of throwing them at something. I want to make sure that the wine that I put into those barrels is what that wine needs. And for these two barrels in particular, I have more than plenty of ways that I can utilize them this coming harvest. So I'm not worried about that in any way, shape, or form. It's going to be just fine. At least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> and... And we'll continue to use kind of this weird proportion of some new barrels and some used barrels as time goes on. Yeah, this this really is just another subjective thing where, you know, if you need that big impact, yes, you probably want to buy more new barrels. In fact, I'm working with a client right now uh, that I'm consulting for where typically I my winemaking leans a little bit more light-handed with new oak, but I'm going to them, you know, in a matter of a couple of days and saying, hey, we need to try and snag a couple more new barrels because this wine will actually, it needs it. Like it, it's good now, but with this little bit of extra oak, it's, it's going to be a little bit more of an expense, but you know what? This is probably going to make a better wine all said and done. We've done some barrel trials. We've already tested it out and it's like, okay, we need to probably make this amendment, even though we're about halfway through that aging process. And that's, you know, turning on a dime and doing what the wine needs versus just, winemaking by a recipe, right? It's going to change a little bit every year. You know, talking about the growing seasons and how different they can be. Sometimes certain barrels will work great for certain wines. Sometimes you might need to use other barrels. We've had that happen before. And it's something that we kind of turn and adjust on a dime based on what we're tasting as that wine stops fermenting and it settles down a little bit and we start evaluating what oak barrels we want to use for what lots. So there's always this little bit of, you know, I think sensory evaluation and a lot of consideration that you need to take when deciding what barrels you're going to use and if it's really worth the money to buy all new barrels. It is expensive. You know, if you're paying $800 to $1,200 a barrel and you're buying 100 barrels, do the math. Like, it's, it ain't cheap. I mean, shoot, we use maybe about 50 barrels a year. It's really not that much. But at that price point... I would have to definitely raise my prices. And that's kind of the other nice thing is that if you're buying a brand new barrel, it's going to raise the price of your wine. You're going to have to factor that cost into your product. And if you have the ability to still make these really big, bold wines without 100% new oak, you can actually make a really solid wine at a more affordable price and it works just fine. If those are like, that's where our red blend is. Our red blend and even our Merlot, those are like bang for your buck wines. It's these are, these are meant to just be get out there and get after it kind of wines where we have, you know, the, our single barrels or like our, you know, higher end cab that, you know, are more expensive because we use more new barrels. They're aged longer. They, they take more time and effort. Uh, they're just more expensive to make and you kind of tear out your program that way. So, you know, if you're using hundred percent new barrels, no harm, no foul. I kind of disagree with that mentality just in general. Uh, if you're using 100% new oak on certain wines, that makes sense. But if it's just a across the board policy for the sake of using 100% new oak, I, good luck. Godspeed. I hope it treats you well, basically. All right. Now get into the hospitality side of things. Napa seems to be busier than ever. When is the best time to come and visit? This is a question we get all the damn time and it's a great one because there are a lot of different facets to consider number one actually it's 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 interesting that we're getting this question now because this has been the slowest year that napa has had in terms of tourism and visitation in the last three years uh 2021 2020 sorry two years i mean 2021 and 2022 were two of the biggest busiest years that napa has had in history and this year it is down 
a lot. At least that's the rumblings between wineries, between uh, drivers and transportation, and between hotels. There's a lot of vacancies. There's a lot less people coming to Napa right now. Uh, word on the street is that it's just cheaper to fly to Europe than it is to fly to California right now. So that's probably a part of it. Uh, we know that with inflation and all these other economic factors that maybe people are buttoning down a little bit more. They're, you know, reeling back the disposable income they've, ha they've had in the last few years because of, you know, just cost of living has gone up pretty significantly. So there's a lot of kind of economic factors into, you know, why and people b visit and how busy it really is here. Uh, but to kind of the, the crux of the question is that it really depends on what you want to see. You know, if you come out this time of year, it's a beautiful time. You're going to see the vineyards are green and lush. It's busy. It's going to be, you're going to see some life and liveliness. You're going to get into the restaurants you want to go to. Uh, you're not going to see the craziness of harvest necessarily, but now's a good time to come. You might have these really hot days where it pushes triple digits, but the reality is that it cools off in the fifties at night. So bring a couple of layers, a light jacket, and you'll be fine. The summer is a beautiful time to come out here, particularly July, because July historically has kind of been this slower month in general. So if you want it to be like a little less busy, July is still a great time to come out. If you really want to see the harvest action, you're going to have to come out in the fall, September, October. That's when you want to be here. It is also the busiest time of year. Hotels are typically more expensive. It's harder to get reservations for both restaurants and for tasting. So it takes a little bit more planning to come out in the fall. But it's well worth it, especially if you have not seen the action that Harvest is. Like if you came out to visit us in September and October, you're gonna see me in my work boots, torn up jeans, probably drinking a Coors Banquet beer as I sit by the press and watch a juice come out of it. But we're gonna drink some wine and we're gonna have some fun, let me tell you that. And it, it's just, it's cool to see the process and really understand, you know, and see what it takes, the physical labor that it takes to get grapes off of a vine and make wine out of them. Uh, I swear, once you come out here and you see that and the hard work that people put into it, you'll understand a lot more about what makes a place like Napa or any wine country that's kind of the small place in the grand scheme of the wine world really, really special. Because we're not kicking out and mass producing wine. It's all this, it's a lot of handmade craft stuff and it's a shit ton of work. And coming out during harvest is the best way to experience that. So highly recommend harvest if you've not been out here. Just keep in mind, it can be a little busier. There's a little more traffic. Plan ahead for restaurant reservations. Do not assume you can just walk in and sit at the bar. You're going to have to probably dial it in a little bit more. If you are looking for a much slower pace, just to kick back, relax, the winter is the best time to come. Come in January, February, March. Those three months, it's fantastic. Uh, it can be a little busy the first week of February because typically there's a lot of release parties in that first week. But outside of that, those are arguably, January is one of our slowest months of the year. So it's a great time to be here if you're trying to avoid the crowds, if you want a, probably a better deal on hotel rooms, you want it, it's easier going to be to get restaurant reservations, things of that nature. Keep in mind, because it is our slower time of year, that some restaurants close for like winter cleanings for a couple of weeks. Uh, or their you know, schedules are shortened up or maybe businesses are closed like Mondays and Tuesdays or Sundays and Mondays. So do it, it may, might take a little bit more research, but if you are truly wanting that, you know, that kind of calmer, just more relaxed pace, January, February is a beautiful time to come out. You might catch a little bit of rain like, you, like we did this year, uh, but it's nothing that a rain jacket and an umbrella won't, you know, won't fix you'll be just fine it doesn't really get that cold it does get pretty chilly uh, but bring a couple extra layers if you've been to san francisco in the summertime you can do napa in the winter you'll be fine you'll be just fine all righty last but certainly not least when it comes to the tasting fee conversation oh no uh, i did not read this one i knew it had something to do with tasting fees but shoot uh, when it comes to the tasting fees conversation have there ever has there ever been a time where let me make sure I read this correctly. <laughs> For that, like, I have my notes on my second screen here, so I can make sure I like, keep tabs on stuff out of the corner of my eye. And I just keep. If you if you watch the YouTube video, or if you're watching, you notice I like look away a lot. It's because I have like a couple of notes that I'm working through. And for the Q and A's, it's always the questions. And I always kind of like, you know, cut and paste them, cut and paste them. I just keep them on a notepad. And then come time to record, I just bring them up, browse through them real quick. So I kind of know what I'm getting into. This one I definitely misread initially. So uh, when it comes to 
tastings and charging tasting fees, has there ever been a time where someone got super, super bent out of shape because you charged them a tasting fee? And what did you do to resolve it? Ah, uh, this is like an interview question. This is like this is like interviewing for a hospitality job. There are like there are a couple of there there are a couple like key questions you ask that I ask in particular if when I used to manage people, this was kind of one of those questions where it's you have an unhappy customer, what do you do to solve the issue? That's that's always one question. Uh, my second question was what kind of music do you like and what are the top 3 songs on your playlist? It was a two-parter, but I always ask that question. And number three was a customer calls you and they find your wine discounted in a retail shop across the country somewhere. They're angry that they paid retail price at the winery. What do you do to solve that issue? Those are like the three, those are like my three ace in the hole questions when I'm interviewing someone. And this one is like right in line. It's the, you have an unhappy customer. How do you troubleshoot that? Ugh. All right. So this is typically how we go about it. And I mentioned this a little bit in the tasting fee episode because I wanted to share a little bit of insight as to why we charge people for tastings and there what this would have been I'll try and kind of echo that story a little bit uh, because this is this is typically this is typically what we do and I'll be completely honest at a certain point and this was this customer in particular uh, that I'm thinking of this happened like last fall at some point this is a long time ago and this guy was, I come to find out, I talked to all my colleagues that hosted him as well as the driver. And he was just, he was like that problem customer. I think if you've ever worked in sales, like you've probably had to fire a customer before because they are just, too, they're, they're, their mess is not worth, their juice is not worth the squeeze. Like whatever they're buying from you, like it's just not enough to rationalize them putting you through hell and back. And this was one of those guys. Just, I, I'm... I have the email ingrained in my brain because it was so rude and condescending and awful. And I'm like, dude, guy, like, what do you want from me? But this is how I went about trying to like salvage this relationship, right? So they buy a little bit of wine and not, not up to, you know, the amount that would warrant me waiving a tasting fee, you know? And I, this is all, it's on our order forms. We talk about it. This is not something that they walk into blind. Number one, I tried to, as much as I can, overly communicate. That's kind of number one, right? Is that that lack of communication with a customer can go make things go awry so fast. And when it comes to sales, setting expectations is everything. So that's a huge part of what we do as we're wrapping up a sale, like in as we're hosting guests, is making sure that folks understand kind of how this works, when the wine will be shipped, things of that nature. Like speaking of which, it's too damn hot to ship wine during the summer. So the conversation I have with every single guest is, hey, are you expecting this wine next week or can you wait till the fall when it's cooler? Because number one, we can ship it to you during the summer, but we're going to have to overnight it with ice packs and it's going to be expensive. And them is the ropes because the wine has a very high potential to go bad in this summer heat. We would much rather wait till the fall. And yes, it's going to be kind of delayed gratification, but there's a much better chance your wine's going to arrive safely and you're going to be able to enjoy it at your leisure and not have a bigger customer service issue. So that's like part of that communication, right? That was a tangent, but wanted to like, this is kind of what we do as, as we're wrapping things up in a tasting experience with guests. So we wrap up this tasting experience. They leave. Um, I process the order on, I think I hosted them on a Friday or Saturday because I was watching football. I was watching the Niners game. I'm a Packers fan, but Brittany's a Niners fan, so I gotta watch the friggin' red and gold every once in a while. It's not the most fun, but at least Brock Purdy was halfway decent this year, right? So I'm watching the game, and I just had that feeling, and I looked, no joke, and Brittany will confirm this. I looked at her and I told her, I'm like, I'm gonna charge this order. I guarantee you that in 45 minutes or less, I hear from this guy. And sure enough, I charge the order, I send the receipt out, say thank you for visiting, I appreciate your purchase, here's your receipt, itemized with the little bit of wine he bought and, and the tasting charges that were on there. Less than 45 minutes, he writes back, not particularly pleased that they were charged tastings. And this is all via email too, like this is not 
over the phone. So you kind of, you know, you can't really get tone from an email. It's tough to do because you can kind of you try and make some sort of a, you know, bullshit assumption as to what mood they're in, but you don't know what mood they're in. You don't know where they're at. Uh, when they start using all capitals like this guy does, then you kind of know that they're quietly shouting at you, right? It's the per my last email. You're like, oh God, here we go. Oh, it's the worst. Anyway, so I'll, I'll paraphrase, but that he was disappointed that, you know, they were charged tasting fees. They bought wine and insinuated that I did not appreciate his purchase and that his purchase was not good enough for us. And that's where he started to use all caps as a part of that. And I was like, oh, OK, now I'm going to try and save this to the best of my ability. So I fire an email right back because I'm at my computer and I want to, you know, time is of the essence. Like we're going to try and take care of this guy. So I quickly send him a note. I say, you know, uh, you know, apologies for your, you know, dissatisfaction. Uh, here is our policy. This is what was on the order form. Here's a copy of your order form and where you signed. You know, let's. I'm happy to have a conversation about this, but very typically, this is why. This is how we waive tastings when it comes to you know how much wine you purchase, and then of course if you join the wine club. Now I knew. After the fact, uh, through my industry sources, that this guy did not like our wines, like period. He bought like a couple, a few bottles like out of a courtesy. So I knew full well he was not going to add on to the order to try and waive the tasting feel, much less join the wine club. So I had some insider knowledge that this was probably going to be a losing battle. You don't always have that. You want to assume the best that they actually really enjoyed the experience. So that's what I'm going to try and lean on is I hope you really enjoyed it and that what I heard was just, I don't know, some nonsense that someone was just talking shit or something. But I'm going to try my best to still salvage this. So I send the email, tell him our policy. And he I'll keep in mind, he didn't ask for a refund. He didn't um, insinuate that he wanted one. He was just mad that they were charged about it. And at that point, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm going to try and rationalize as to why we do it. Here is our policy. This is the form you signed. Like, this is how things are done. He fired back with another email that basically talked about and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it was no joke. Here's how much money we spent over this week, over the course of three days. It was north of 20K. Um, here's you know, how we are normally treated at wineries. We've never been treated like this in our life. This is the most disrespect we've ever seen. Yada, yada, just goes down and down and down. And, and I'm like, dude, I don't know how much money you have in your bank account. Like you're out here in Napa. Like we deal with the rich and the famous every day. Like I don't care how much money you spent this weekend, but this was our policy. And at the end of that email, he said, please cancel my order. And I was like, OK, well, you know, because typically it's like, well, hey, 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 let me this is one of those moments where it's like, let me comp whatever I can. Let me wave. Let me d refund the tasting fees. I actually didn't charge him shipping because it was his birthday. That was a fun fact. But, you know, there's there's that instinct to like, I got to save the sale. But based on here, I'm going to say it, the tone of those emails. And I only say tone because he was capitalizing things in an aggressive way. <laughs> <laughs> all caps the caps lock was on for this guy and he was just he was being obnoxious and he was being very douchey about it. i'm like i don't care how many commas you have in your bank account home slice like this is our policy and i know and again i knew that you didn't like the wines i don't know what you want me to do man and the more I heard about this guy from other people, even after the fact of this, they're like, yeah, this is some dude. Like, we're not, he's just, we've unsubscribed him from the mailing list. Like, we're not dealing with him. <laughs> he was just one of those guys that, like, wanted the free shit for the sake of the free shit because, hey, this is how I expect to be treated and not necessarily hold up the other end of whatever bargain he allegedly has given you. It, and this this probably sounds... I, I don't know how some of you are going to take this, but this is the kind of stuff we deal with where there's like this level of expectation of like, oh, I bought two bottles. You need to take care of shipping. You need to take care of this. You need to take care of that. And we're like, that's if I if I comp all that stuff, I'm losing money. <laughs> like that was the situation like th like th that was the situation with this guy. And you have to try and be really polite about it and kind of bite your tongue and just say, sorry, I guess I will refund your order. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. If there's ever anything else we can do for you at any time, please let us know. Send. Bye. I haven't heard from him since. It's a bummer because as when you run into those issues from a hospitality and customer service, because customer service 
starts when a problem begins, right? So when you have a problem like this, you can do a handful of things. And my instinct, the instinct initially from that first email would be, I'm so sorry that we charge you the tasting fees. We're going to waive those. You'll see a refund on your bank statement in the next two to three business days. We're so sorry. I'll make sure that the white wine that you bought ships out your way. And that that's like the gut reaction is I got to save the sale. So you start comping stuff, you start offering free shipping, which you, we already did, and you try and do the best you can, right? But when that asshole meter goes off and there's certain things that are said or typed that are condescending and rude, it means that I'm going to give you less of a leash, right? Because now you're officially, now you're on the fence. Do I actually want you as a customer if you're going to cause me this many problems or don't I? And this guy made it really easy for me to decide. And it's a bummer because we had a nice time. I thought I had a great time with them. And actually, we hit it off right when they arrived. We had a great conversation. I, I thought it was, it was fun, but it just ended up going south some way down the line. And so when you get in trouble in hospitality, you're like waiving tasting fees. There's plenty of tools that we have, whether it's waiving that tasting fee, whether it's explaining kind of, hey, here's how things are. And we try to mitigate it in the best way possible. And we try to make sure that you are getting the wine that you want and not having to pay tasting fees. But again, keep in mind, if you listen to that tasting episode, you, you already know this, is that it comes at a huge expense to host guests, to open wine, to staff it, to pay the rent, keep the lights on. If you're not buying a significant amount of wine, and significance is going to depend on the winery. Some people are going to ask you to buy cases. Some people might ask you to buy a bottle. Some people allegedly will still offer free tastings like Sutter Home does down the street, right? It's going to depend on winery to winery. So when you're booking your experiences out in Napa, talking about you know visiting Napa, it's worth asking. Especially if you're booking through a tour company and they're organizing your itinerary, ask them. Get that information from those folks. That way, when you walk into a certain winery, you know exactly what you need. Or if you're sitting down with somebody like, hey, by the way, what's the tasting fee? And is there a way to get that waived? That's fine. Ask that question. That's a fine question. It's, it's a shame that it has to be asked, but it's, it is unfortunately the way of the world. And I promise you that if you have a rough experience, 99 times out of 100, we will do everything we can to make it right. But many of us have very low thresholds for asshats. So don't be one of those. You know, we will do our best to work with you. But again, we have to work with you. It's, we're not just going to give you the farm. All right. Uh, that's always a weird. It's, it's so touchy. Like I always want to talk more about the hospitality side of things because I've got some great stories. I think I might do that in the next episode. We might do just a tasting and hospitality decompression. I'll, t I'll share some ridiculous story, and I mean ridiculous stories, um, of what some of us hospitality professionals go through uh, in entertaining folks at wineries. It's some pretty awful stuff. Um, it's gonna be a good episode. We're definitely doing that. So I appreciate that question because that's that's a that's a tough subject for me to broach because I really don't want to feel like I'm talking down to anybody or that I don't appreciate people that come out to the winery. Uh, but that kind of stuff happens where you have folks that are just more of a pain than they should be. And man, I got to tell you, I got a low bullshit meter. It, that's it's plain and simple. I, I like to think I'm pretty easy to get along with. So. It takes a lot to get me fired up like that. Anyway, we got to get into a wine of the week. I'm switching gears. I'm changing subjects. I'm done talking about asshole clients. None of, if you're listening to this, you're not an asshole client. You're an angel. The best ever, actually. Love you. Mean it. Uh, this wine of the week, I actually was walking through the store this afternoon uh, before recording this podcast. Uh, we were stocking up on some white wines, and I needed to buy some bubbles because we're hosting a little uh, brunch this Sunday. And I saw this lovely Cremant de Alsace. Lucien Albrecht, I'm probably mispronouncing that. I think the glare from my camera is gonna do this. So if you're on YouTube, this, sorry, this is gonna be a pain. Hold on, there we go. I turned off the light, that should help. This guy right here is probably one of my favorite commands out there. I think I've seen it like as low as like 18 bucks in some places. And I think we got it for like, it was somewhere around like 22 or 20, uh, something like that. Uh, for those that don't know, Cremant is what they call sparkling wines that, in France that aren't made in Champagne. 
Uh, so it allows places like Alsace, Burgundy, the Loire Valley, other spots to make sparkling wine. Uh, it's just not going to be called champagne because remember, kids, champagne only comes from champagne. Everything else is sparkling wine, Prosecco, Cremant, or Cava. Those, that, them is the rules. I didn't make them. So this guy here, though, if you're looking for like just affordable, crushable bu bubbles for any time of day, let's say a Sunday brunch that you're cooking on your griddle, this is what I'm going to have in my glass as I'm frying up bacon and eggs and hash browns this Sunday. It's going to be light out. I'm so excited that I saw it. It's not hard to find, I don't think, either. This is pretty widely distributed and imported. Uh, this is one of those wines that... You know, we talk all the time about supporting the little guys when we can. This is one of, I, you know, they're they're probably, a, they're a bigger production, but damn it, the wine's good and it's affordable and you can crush it on a Sunday morning with your friends. It's going to be the best. So the Lucien Albrecht uh, Cremant Alsace, this is the Brut Rosé. It's lights out. Highly recommend it. I'll put a link to it uh, as usual in the description so that you can track it down back home if you like to try and find it. So... Thank you all so, so much for tuning in. This was this was a feisty episode between opinions on barrels and the growing season, especially the hospitality side of things. I am totally going to share probably my top, let me think how many stories I have. I have one, two for sure. Uh, I have probably another, actually three, four or five, maybe like four or five different stories. If I can fit them into one episode, I will try my damnedest, but it, I might not be able to. But we'll cover at least two or three of them of just the madness that we experience out here hosting wine tastings and entertaining guests. It's bonkers. It would surprise you. Some of you might not be that surprised. I mean, people have been drinking all day. Crazier things have happened. But you figure, let's go. Like, oh, Napa's a classy place. It'll be just fine. And then things go off the rails. But in hindsight, really entertaining. So we'll get into that next week. I promise we're going to get into some really awesome tasting room and hospitality stories next week. We haven't really had like the fun talk shit episode yet. It's been we're we're over 20 episodes now. We haven't gotten there yet. We're doing it. Episode this is episode 20 two or three, right? It was at the beginning. It probably says it in the title. This will be the next one. It was going to be so much fun. Thank you again so much for tuning in. Please continue to share, like, subscribe. Uh, this has been just, again, such a blast. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week as we dive into some of the dark corners of the hospitality world uh, here in the good old Napa Valley. Cheers. Cheers.